Hey friends, thanks for hanging out with us today here at the Heritage Alliance. Um, it's Anne back again in a new building, new old building. This is Oak Hill School. And I'm sure many of you have actually been here in this building. Might have been a while, but I'm sure you've been here. Um, if you can't hear me, put it in the chat or let Megan know because Megan's watching. So we're going to talk about getting to all here today to get you up and kind of moving because, you know, some of our other activities kind of involve sitting. So first, before we, we play, we're going to get up and stretch it out. So if you want to get up and kind of, you know, do some stretches to get ready to talk about some games that maybe you have these toys at your house or you want to play them. But we're just going to get a little more active. And we do this with our kids at the schoolhouse too because, yeah, there's always a lot of sitting. School involves a lot of sitting, whether you're doing it at home or 100 years ago. You guys sit down and read a book, right? Um, so you want to take a break, kind of stretch, stretch it out. All right. So we're actually going to be making a, a toy today. Our uh, first toy, we're going to make it. Um, and you all are going to get a version delivered to your house. Um, Miss Jillian is going to bring you what you need to make a buzzsaw or a whirly gig. This is probably my favorite toy here at Oak Hill School. Now the schoolhouse is set over 100 years ago. So today, it's March 24th, 1893. So we're over 100 years ago here at Oak Hill School. And so we play toys and games that kids 100 years ago would have played. And one of the really popular toys was the buzz saw or whirly gig. And you'll see how it got its name. So when you have one, you can buy these online, um, but you can also make your own. We're gonna make our own. So you also gonna be able to do at home. When you have one, you gotta get the disc, the spinning disc that has all the holes in it, right in the middle. As you wind it up real tight towards your face, not hitting your face. And it's gonna get tighter and tighter, and the rope gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then you pull on both ends. And this momentum, and this, you know, the, the string being wound up keeps it going. I'll come a little closer to you. If I get close enough, you might be able to hear it. it makes a whirring noise. A part of that is how it got its name, buzz saw. It's like, you know, a buzz saw that looks kind of like this and cuts wood. And then whirly gig, because what does it do? The works. So this is an older toy. And as long as you keep that string wound, it'll keep going. And then, you know, you kind of stop and it'll wind itself down. So um, kind of like a really old version of a fidget spinner, only you're using ropes instead of your fingers. So how can you make your own? Well, you're going to need two things to make your own. First, you're going to need a button. And I have all these buttons, and this is what's going to go with Miss Jillian to you all. Now, of course, originally it would have been wood, like this, but you can use a modern button, it'll work. You just need a bigger button, not a teeny tiny button, but a bigger button. So this is our bag of buttons. I already picked one out. I've got this blue button right here on this blue string. I didn't, you know, do a different color. Probably could have, but it's already on the screen. <laughs> um, do I need to come to you or just use it? Uh, I can't okay. because you're not. All right. So here we have our little button. So what you're going to need after your button, that's part one. Part two is a string to go through the button so we can wind up our, our, our buzz saw. So you, um, you'll get a piece of string too, already pre-cut, so you have a good length, because you want a good length to be able to twirl it, because you need to keep uh, that string wound up. So I've got my button already halfway threaded, so now I'm gonna thread it through the other eye. So you, know, you come up through the back, go through the front, and then what you wanna do with the string, and it involves a little bit of spit, so make sure you just keep your own buzz saw for, you know, for sanitation's sake. It's your buzz saw, you flicked it. 
Could you use a shoestring too, Anne? You could use a shoestring. Yeah, you are going to get, um, this is a ribbon. It's not idea, but it's the best thing I have. But you are going to get some really good thread to go with it. But you could use a shoestring. You just got to make sure it actually fits through your buttonhole. That's the biggest key here. So what you do is you go through the button. And actually, it's better. Hold on. You want to go diagonally. That's for the best. Oh, I actually went side by side. That's not the best. I'm gonna go diagonally. So let me do this again. I actually have a separate video just about making one of these. See, that's why ribbon's not the best because it kind of like threads and tears. You are getting good string. Does your button have to be a certain size or can it be any button? Um, a bigger button works. You don't want a teeny tiny button because it's gonna be harder to do mm -hmm. and it probably won't turn as well. Bigger buttons are better for this one. Bigger buttons are better. Bigger buttons are better. <laughs> All right, there we go. So you kind of want it to be, you know, diagonal. So then you want to get your button kind of in the middle. Remember we talked about your button needs to be in the middle. So then you're going to go tie the end because we need two ends. Good knot. You might need your parents' help with this or an older brother or sister's help or an adult, you know. The cat and dog probably can't help you with this because they don't have opposable thumbs. So you get your button in the middle. Once you're on, see, you've got these nice little finger hooks here. So we're going to hear in the middle. Then same thing. You're going to wind it up really, 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 really tight. And then it might take a few times at first to get it nice and warmed up. But still wind it up, 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 up. Don't hit your face. Watch your face. Watch other people's faces. And then it'll go. And actually, your string is more like the string in the big buzz saw. So it'll work better than the ribbon. The ribbon's probably not the best. But you are getting string like that's a little more adapted. This. This was just the best piece of string I had on hand because I'm giving you all the good string. <laughs> but it will, once you get it in the middle, it will go. And actually, something like this works even better. That's kind of what you guys are getting. It's a little coarser than the ribbon. I actually tried it on this button earlier, but it wasn't long enough. So I'm going to make sure that your string is longer so that you have the space to do it in. So you're going to get both these pieces in a little baggie, and you can make your own buzzsaw. And I'll actually send Miss Jillian a link to a video too that just goes over. Oh, there. Oh, it was starting. That goes over um, how you can make your own toy. Now, some people used to uh, put these actually in other people's hair. Don't do that either. So that's a no. Okay, so you all will get to do that. And yours, once you have it, like I said, it's gonna be more like this one. There's a smaller version, but it should wind up real nice for you all. And go, go, go. So this is the buzz saw. Yes, it's probably my favorite toy we have. And we're gonna talk about some other toys now. And you all can share if you've ever played them before, um, if you know how to play it, or some favorite toys you have. A little closer. All right. Anyone know what this toy is here? See if I know what this is. You can type it in the chat. You can unmute yourself and shout it out. See if I think they know what this toy is here. Uh, a top is what one person said. Oh, that's a good guess. Uh huh. Involves these two pieces. They're attached. I don't know if that helps any. So this one's kind of exactly what it looks like. Um, they weren't very imaginative with a name on this one. It's not like a cool name, like a buzz saw, but it's a cup because you got a cup, you got a ball. So it's called cup and ball. <laughs> They're very straightforward on this toy. But again, it's another old toy. And how you do it is you want to get the, the goal is to get this ball and this cup and you want it to stay there. All right. You don't want it to bounce back out and you want it to stay there. So it has a simple name, not so simple a toy. So I actually 
I'm not very good at it. <laughs> you gotta be careful too when you play this one that you don't hit yourself in the face with the ball. That was kind of like the theme of all those old tools. Don't hit yourself in the face. And you don't have to have a ball that's attached, right? It just makes it easier. It does, yeah. I mean, you can toss the ball up in the air and try to catch it in the cup. But the point of this one is that, you know, you, it's on the string so that when it gets in there, hopefully it stays. And, you know, it has a limited range. Oh, oh yeah. it. it has a limited range of motion um, because you know, it can only go so far. It can only swing so far. So that was kind of the challenge of the game. Now, there are different versions of this. Of course, this one is super colorful um, and large. Um, hold real quick, I'm going to grab actually another one to show to you. And so all of these are before TV and radio and all the other types of entertainment that we have today, right? And they're also mobile, so they can go with you. You go can take them you. everywhere. Exactly. You can put it in your pocket. You can take it to and from school. Okay, here's a smaller version, not as colorful, a little smaller, but same thing. That's tiny. It is tiny. So maybe it's more of a challenge. I had a kid here once who did this eight times in a row. It's all on the wrist. So I've been told. So probably will get it again. So you have smaller versions and then you have like advanced versions. Kind of like video games, like level up. Where this isn't so much cup and ball. This is like cup and like a uh, pig and ball. So, um, ball and stick. Stick, yeah. So again, same components. But now the goal is to get the ball to do this. There. Get the ball to do this, which I can't even do the other version. So I don't know how people do this. This is like all about balance. And then if you get bored of this kind, this has two ways you can do it. Get the ball to rest here or get the ball to go there. I mean, like how, you know, I can't even imagine how skilled you gotta be to catch that. I mean, that's, yeah. So several versions of this simple toy. So once you mastered cup and ball, you could do you know ball and stick or ball and like little cup here. So a tiny peg here. So multiple versions of the same toy, but all the same goal, goal uh, to keep you entertained. And then also probably like work on your fine motor skills with your hands. And did kids buy these toys or did people, did their parents make them or did they make them? How did they get the toys? I have a good question. So sometimes you would buy them. But like, what are most of these toys made out of? What's everything I've shown you so far been made out of? Got somebody that said wood and they are right, yeah. Correct, wood. So a lot of people are making their own toys. Um, you would carve them with a knife, maybe you'd use a saw to cut them, but most people are carving them with a knife by hand and that's how they are making these toys because that's how people are able to do it. So, you know, if you put it, order something through a catalog for a birthday or Christmas or any other celebration. Um, you can know, start working in advance, make a cup and ball, because as long as you have the wood, you can make it. You just need a string to attach it and then you can just paint it. So um, yeah, lots of people would make their own toys. I showed you how to make a buzz saw out of a button. So a lot of people, if they couldn't buy a buzz saw or you know, they couldn't make something like this, you had a button and you had a string. So that's how you can make it. All right, so the next one. All right, what is this one? Somebody had guessed this earlier. Somebody did guess this earlier. It's of course, the top, we can book, there we go. It's hard to hold this in. There it goes. Ah, Haley Grace said a talk. So. Yes, there it went. <laughs> right um, answer, just different question. Yep, this is the top. Of course, again, what is this made out of? Wood. So you can make your own. Today, sometimes their tops are made out of metal, plastic. They have ones that light up. But this one's just as effective. You know, it's made out of wood. It's really good at falling on the floor. But this is made out of wood. Wood is great. So again, we talked about earlier, you know, why you would make things out of metal because it's harder to break it. And in this case, you know, wood, it's harder to break this wood. It's not like some sort of plastic or glass that hits the ground and it's going to break. Um, this is going to stay intact. All right. Let's try another one. 
They come up tight. Good, good. Who thinks they know what this is? That's four point. I did that time. Ring toss. Ring toss, yes. Ring toss. Uh, another weird word, a really old word for this, and nobody uses to describe this game anymore, is actually uh, coits, which I forgot why it's called coits. I think it's either from the indigenous people or like French or kind of a mixture thereof. But yeah, ring toss, super easy. Again, made of wood. Of course, the goal, and I'll go back here just to kind of show it from the distance, is to take your little, you know, your little home stand here, your peg, and toss your rings. No score. Almost. Throw one time. If you want to hit that, hit this little point here to get a ringer, it's for points. Or you think I can do it? I was going to say me, but. <laughs> And you know, you can move it further out. So you can move it really far away so people have to really toss it or you can keep it pretty close by. But yeah, you know, same thing, game of sort of skill. And all that, you can see kind of all these about working your hands and working your wrists and developing your, your motor skills. So. Well, it's kind of like horseshoes too, right? Like yeah. those were items that everybody had back when people uh -huh. rode horses. Yeah, exactly. People had, horse, had horses. So you had horseshoes that you would toss and try to get points with. And it's just kind of like simple as that. Like, what do you have around you? You can make a game out of. I know you won't make up games today. We still do it. All right, this one's. We're probably gonna get this one. For sure, you're gonna get this one. Hasn't changed much, has it? No, this is one of those things that hasn't changed with time. Here's what this is. Mm. A jump oh, so. Yeah, yeah. A jump Yes, I'm not going to demonstrate this one. This is much too small for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, jump ropes haven't changed much with time. And we have all kinds of like songs and games that go with jump ropes. A lot of them teaching you how to count or how to rhyme. And sometimes you'd even have something that would talk about a historical event, like London Bridge is falling down about the time that that happened to London Bridge and it caught fire. And it became a, like a rhyme, became a song. And it's kind of also teaching you something while you sing the song. All right. Like I said, these are all things you can still buy today or you can make, you can make your own jump rope. And hopefully next time you're able to come to Oak Hill School, you'll be able to actually play with these games. So our next one, I'm gonna show you the pieces. See if you can guess kind of what it's for, but it's got two parts. We got this piece and we got this ball right here. Again, lots of wood. So who thinks they know what this game might be based on what I'm showing you? How do you think this game works? Hmm. So those are pins and that's a rolling yeah, ball? Yeah, these are pins and this is a ball that rolls. What do you think I need to do with these pins? Like, what do you think the goal is with this ball and these pins? So a rolling ball. It's like the version today, you usually have to go to a, a, like an alley, sometimes you call it an alley or a lane. Um, bowling. A bowling alley. Yes, yeah, yeah, good, job. yeah good job. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna pick up the ring. Try to keep the toys neat. <laughs> Yes, it is bowling. Um, this is called nine pins. So it's like a miniature kid version of bowling. And I'll set it up on the desk real quick. How many of you like to go bowling? It's another sport that's been around a long time. Woo! Yeah, these are like kind of like almost closed pins. They kind of look like closed pins, only they don't close. It's like without the little snipping mechanism. This one actually won't stand anymore because it's not played so much. Okay, here we go. Kind of look like little people. They do kind of look like little people. So you set them up and then like regular bowling, the point is to knock, knock pins down with the ball, not your hand. 
Yeah, I'm just oh, almost a circle. One left standing. And that's how you would keep score. So sometimes people couldn't go to a bowling alley. Uh, they didn't have one near them. But you can make this version that you can play like at your house, at school, um, in an alleyway, you know, between buildings. So this, again, another version you can take with you. Because look, it comes with a handy dandy carrying pouch so you can keep it all together. It's and called nine pins because you were supposed to have nine of these. And the British had a version of this game, right, Anne? And so after the American Revolution, the American colonists came up with their own version of what is now bowling, right? Yes, so that's exactly. one of the sports we got from our colonial past. Yes. All right, I'm gonna grab the next game real quick. Okay. So to play this next game, and some of you all might know this one, you need a hoop. Usually you'd have some fancy ribbons tied to it so it didn't get lost, but you don't have to have fancy ribbons tied to it. It's just a hoop made of wood and then two sticks. You can be, you can be tree sticks to catch the hoop with. Does anyone know from your time in Oak Hill School or maybe watching other things what this game is called? It seems a little weird. You wouldn't think of it, um, but it's called Great Graces. G-R-A-C-E-S. Um, maybe you know someone named Grace. So Grace is, is a game that you can play with two people or a big group of people. Because everyone had to have two sticks and you had to have one hoop. No matter how many people you have, you got to have just one hoop. And what you would do is you put the stick through your hoop. Okay, I'm gonna actually shoot at the camera. I'm sure you try to shoot over the camera <laughs> to make it. And then you buzz it. Yay, she actually caught it. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that was how you play Graces. And again, you can buy this online or make your own version. How did it get its name, Graces? Because all of our games get their names somehow. Well, this is because hundreds of years ago, when people were playing this, um, you know, today I'm wearing pants, but for a long time, Ladies did not wear pants. Ladies wore skirts, very full skirts with hoops and everything else in them. Um, so this was a game that ladies could play in those big skirts and be graceful while doing it. So like very like elegant movements um, and not have to run a whole lot. So that's how I got the name Graces. So you could be graceful while playing this game. Um, you know, today when we play it, we're not so much graceful. I've seen some very high stakes grace games. But that, that was the intended purpose. And it's still fun all these years later. So I'm gonna toss it once more to Megan and then we'll go on. Ah, uh, you got to down the road. Woo -woo. The only problem with this game is you have to be careful of trees. Uh, you might lose your hoop in a tree. So you have to be careful when you're shooting it that you're kind of aiming it so it doesn't get lost on a roof or in a tree because I've seen both things happen. But it's a really fun game. And it's a game that you can play for a long time out on the lawn, and it's a good distance game because you have to be far enough away from a person to you know, throw the hoop to them. So it's a really good distance game, way to have fun with friends. Great. It's a social distancing game. It is a social distancing <laughs> game from long ago, from long ago. Um, those are the, the majority of the toys we play with here at Oak Hill School. Now, of course, kids ask us, did kids play tag? Yes, they played tag. They also really like a game called Red Rover. If you're familiar with Red Rover, where you stand in the two lines and one person will call someone else over and you try and run and break through the line. Hide and seek, played hide and seek for a long time. Um, hopscotch, where you draw the chalk, which is up here, where you draw the numbers on the sidewalk and then do the hopscotch. So all those games have been around for a long time and kids still play them today. So for this last little bit, why are we on time? Uh, we are at 1.40. Okay, awesome. So for this last little bit, um, we're actually gonna do a little thing called I Spy, which I'm sure you are familiar with I Spy, another game that's been around for a long time. You don't have to have any special toys or gadgets for it. Just gonna have your eyes and, and your head. So I'm gonna 
say something, I spy in a schoolhouse, and you guys try and guess what it is, and then we'll talk about it. So let me see, let me find, I'm gonna move just a little. All right, so let this Megan come over to this way. She's kind of giving me a look mm -hmm. of the schoolhouse. And then kind of where, where you are right now, I spy something, I spy something orange. You see something orange, something the color orange. Shout it out if you see it, mm. or put it in the chat. Somebody said a hat? A hat, yes, what? yes. It's amazing that they knew that that was a hat. It's a faded hat. Uh, actually, I think it was once red, but now it's faded to orange because it cut it so long. Uh, does anybody know what this is? What kind of hat this is? It's a certain kind of hat. Hmm. A gnome hat? It does look like a gnome hat. Yes. Um, this is called a dunce cap. And it looks kind of funny today. It does very much look like a gnome hat. So yes. Um, but it has this letter D on here for a dunce, which hundreds of years ago was a very not nice word for essentially like stupid. Yeah, you don't want to call anybody a dunce. You don't want to call anybody a dunce. Um, so when a kid misbehaved in school, um, the teacher would make them wear the dunce cap. You'd have to put it on and there'd be a stool, a stool in the front of the room and you'd have to sit on it in front of the whole class. And it looks silly today, but you would not be smiling. You look like this. That's embarrassing. It was embarrassing. Uh, it was to make you embarrassed so that you wouldn't misbehave again. But yeah, so that's what people would have to do, come up and wear the dunce cap and sit on the stool in front of the class. How long did they have to sit there, Ann? It would depend on what you did. I mean, the teacher's going to decide how long you have to sit there. Maybe it's just 10 minutes. Maybe it's a lot longer. So, but it's kind of be up to the, to the teacher. All right, so I spy something blue. Hmm. Something blue. Hmm. Something blue. You might have to look up high. Hmm. I also have some white with it. Something blue and white. Hmm. Is it the flag, perhaps? It is the flag. Yeah, yes. good job. So we have our flag here. Of course, it's red, white, and blue. I already did red, so it's blue and white. And this flag has 44 stars. So it's an old flag from 18, 1890s. Does anybody know how many stars we have on the flag today? Of course, the stars represent the states. So how many states are in the United States of America? 50. Yep, 50, correct. We've got more than 44 now, but at this time of the schoolhouse, uh, we just had 44 stars. So we've had some states got to join the country since then. All right, we're gonna wonder a little. Do you know the last state to join the United States? That would be Hawaii. Okay. Hawaii is our last state. All right, I'm gonna wonder over here. Let's see, I spy something yellow. Mm. Something yellow. Mm. You might. Have to look down something yellow. Is it the map? It is the map. Yep, parts of the map. So this map is what the country looked like in 1839. So a very long time ago. Um, and what's cool about this map though, of course here you get Tennessee. Tennessee is blue on this map. Um, but Texas is right here. And Texas, this is after Texas broke away from Mexico, but it's not yet a state. So actually on this map, it is, it is its own independent little republic country down there. But we use this map with our classes and they try to you know, differentiate the states and the territories in different colors. So that's yellow. All right, let's see. I spy something. White. Something, something white. Something white. Something white. Something uh, white. Is it the chalk? 
chalk is a good guess. Yes, the chalk is white. Of course, you use the chalk on the blackboards. Mm -hmm. Is it the feathers? It is the feathers. Oh, somebody said the board, which is a good guess. That's right, too. Guess too. Yeah. So in this case, it's these little feathers, which quill pins. And if you all been to schoolhouse, you probably remember writing with the quill pen. Um, not very easy. Um, you know, today we use computers to do a lot of our writing or paper and pencil. Um, but hundred years ago, you'd use the quill pen and the ink. And then also, you know, of course, by this time you had chalkboard and chalk. So this is another way that people used to, you know, record their thoughts, feelings, and write down history. So hopefully when you're able to come back to the schoolhouse, you can write with the quill pen again, but you can also buy your own or make your own at home and do them uh, as well. And you may have practice with a quill pen at another historic site. Lots of historic sites give you the chance to, to write with a quill pen. What kind of birds do the feathers come from? Good question. Um, these are goose feathers. That's usually pretty common. Uh, geese shed a lot of feathers. Geese are pretty common. So this is actually a goose quill pen, but you know, I've seen them from other birds as well, but mostly you're gonna find um, geese. Hmm. Let's see. Okay. I spy something, something black. I spy something black. The blackboard? Good guess. Yes. We definitely have blackboards all around the schoolhouse. Um, spy something black. The furnace? Yes. Yes. Pot-bellied stove. Why do we call it pot-bellied stove? Because it's kind of got like a little pot belly right here. So um, this was the heat source for the schoolhouse to keep you nice and warm during the winter. And this actually, you can burn coal, coal in the stove or wood. So we have um, actually a bucket down there, coal, but you would put it, you know, right in there to get it going and light it. This actually was made in Bristol by the Bristol Foundry. They used to make stoves in Bristol. Um, again, it's made of iron. So that way it can withstand the heat and it's gonna last a really long time. But because it's made of iron, if there's a fire going in here, what do you think is gonna to happen to this stove? What's gonna to happen to the stove if it's got a fire inside of it? It is metal. You think it's gonna get hotter? It's gonna get really hot. Really hot, yes. You wouldn't be able to touch it when it was going. Actually, it might turn a little red so that way you would know it was hot. And you'd be able to smell it too and feel the heat. So you wouldn't want to touch it anyhow. Um, but if you remember from storytelling, if you were in storytelling, I talked about stove and soup. And that Oak Hill School, the teacher used to make soup on the stove. Now that was a bigger stove. This isn't the stove that was in the schoolhouse originally. So you would have needed a bigger stove to be able to put a pot on it and make soup. But a lot of schoolhouses had a bigger stove. Uh, this one's a little smaller, but it's kind of like you know the one that would have been here. Um, and if you're sitting right here, you're going to be nice and warm. If you're sitting in the very back of the room, you're not going to be as warm. So sometimes students, uh, you may have done this when you came to Oak Hill School, sometimes students would bring wood for the fire. And if you brought a lot of wood for the fire, sometimes the teacher would let you sit closer. So it was a way to sit closer to the stove by helping the teacher out. All right, let's see. I think we've got one more. Oh, no, we'll do two more. All right, so I spy something silver. Mm. Something silver. Something, something. Spy something silver. The bucket? The bucket, yes. So we have this bucket hanging here and this ladle, actually. I'm gonna get out of the sun a little bit so it's easier for you to see. Uh, there's nothing in the bucket, but what do you think you would have in here? What do you think you would put in this bucket that you would need to ladle out? Water. Yep, water, yes. So, you know, um, if you go to a building where a school is today, it usually has a water fountain. At home, you know, you've got drinks in the fridge, you've got a kitchen sink, you've got water bottles. But in this school, you didn't have any of that. So you'd have a student whose job it was to go to the nearest spring, well, water source and fill up the bucket for the day with water 
And then you'd have like the drinking ladle that students would drink out of through the day whenever they got thirsty. So there were lots of jobs in an old school house. Bring the wood for the fire, help clean the blackboards, get the drinking water for the day. And of course, at the end of the day, you, know, you gotta dump out what's not used because you don't want that water to sit overnight. So lots of jobs to help out your teacher. We'll put this back. All right, I spy something brown. There's lots of brown here, but one thing specific, brown. Is it the desk? Good guess, no, but the desks are definitely brown. Again, made out of wood. Mm. Something up high and brown. Is it the hat? Not the hat, but that is where you would hang your hats on the little coat rack here. You couldn't wear your hat at a desk. Is it this rope? It is this rope. Who thinks they know what this rope goes to? If I pull this rope, who thinks they know what's going to happen? Is a bucket of water going to fall on your head? <laughs> no, no. A piano is not going to fall on my head either. <laughs> uh, Haley is guessing the bell. Yes, correct. Yes, if I pull this rope, and I will hear in just a minute, the bell will ring. Um, and that was to let students know when school was starting and also when school was ending. Um, and two, it could be like a warning signal for the community. If there wasn't a school, but if there was a fire or something, people might go to the schoolhouse bell and ring and be like, hey, there's a problem. Um, you know, someone in town needs help. So I'll give it a pull. I would probably hear that. It's a little louder on the outside of the building because it was to let you know out there. Or like if you went home for lunch, sometimes kids didn't stay in school and eat. They went home. And so hearing the bell would let them know, oh, school's starting back. I got to get back to school. Yes, that's what this road does. It rings the bell. All right. And we still have bells in school. We just have bells in school. It's just we don't pull them anymore. They're on, you know, they're on systems. You might have a bell in your homeschool. Like maybe your, your, your teacher or your parent sets an alarm that rings when class is done. Um, so yeah, just a way to mark time, a very effective way to mark time. Do y'all have any questions or anything else you saw when we were walking around that you want to know more about? Let me see if anybody is in our chat. Uh, we don't have any questions at the moment. Well, I hope hopefully you can come back to Oak Hill School in person soon. Oh, we do have one question. How long did school last? Oh, good question. So uh, kids would come. So usually, you know, Oak Hill School was part of a farming community. It was for the kids at Knob Creek, which is today part of Johnson City. Um, so they would usually get up in the morning. They lived and worked on a farm, most of them. So they had chores to do, like milk the cow or get the eggs. So after you did your chores, you'd walk to school. So school started later, usually, than what we think of school today. It would start like, you know, 10-ish. Um, and then you would go home later. So sometimes it'd be till five o'clock, school would go to five o'clock, and then you'd go home for supper and your evening chores. But a lot of kids didn't take homework with them um, because you had books that lived at school and you usually couldn't take them back and forth. And maybe you didn't have, like today we are used to having like these great libraries in our houses. Um, or even on our phones or our tablets, we can have a book right there. But that wasn't the case. So, you know, when you were at school, you were supposed to do your work. You didn't usually take any of that home with you because the teacher knew also that when you got home, you had more chores to do. Like you probably had to feed the animals again um, before you went to bed. So school was definitely designed to be kept kind of in the schoolhouse. Uh, someone else asked, what age did kids start school? Yeah, so um, first grade at this point in history, so usually six or seven years old. Uh, you didn't have kindergarten at the time. You didn't have preschool. Um, you know, parents would educate kids at home then. Uh, but as far as like formal education, six or seven, what we think of first grade. And Oak Hill School was first grade through eighth grade. So you can look at the room and you would have first grade through eighth grade all together in this one room. So that's a, you know, a bunch of different ages in this one space. But you all do that today with your homeschooling. So it's very, very traditional. Um, and when you got to eighth grade, you graduated from Oak Hill School. And it was a big test. It was like a three-day test to graduate. You wrote your answers down, and then you had to defend them orally. So there were two parts to the exam, written and verbal. 
And it was kind of determined that most people then didn't go on to high school or college. That eighth grade was probably the highest level you were gonna get in your schooling. So that you needed to know everything you might need to know in your life in eighth grade. So that's why it was such a big test because for a lot of people, they didn't go on to high school or college. Like today we go to high school um, and then some people go to college, but then, you know, you've got your primary schooling. And for a lot of people, that was, that was, that was it. Uh, how long was this classroom used for? And was it, did they stop using it in the 1800s? No, it was around for a while. So the schoolhouse was built in 1886 and it was a school until 1952. And it was a part of Washington County Schools. Um, but by the 1950s, they were building bigger schools and they were moving the students out of one room schoolhouses to these bigger buildings uh, because people had better transportation to get to bigger schools. And a lot of people by that time, you know, are going to school longer. They're going to high school. So, you know, education changes with time. So once it stopped being a school in 1952, it said empty. It actually was a barn and I'll show you. Uh, it has some holes in the wall. These are holes from Buckshot where some people just kind of shot up the house, the school when it was empty. It was a barn, people were out in the field, um, you know, sort of just taking pot shots, practicing and hit the school building. So it said empty, it stored hay. There were there was hay in here for a long time. And then it was moved in the 1990s. We took it apart like a big old building shaped puzzle and put it back together and restored it to what you guys see today. So it's been here where it is now for over 20 years. And we've been doing this program for over 20 years. And even though we don't have kids in the building right now, um, you know, we know students will be back and we're happy to be able to share it with you this way. So even if you can never come in person, you can still see it. Well, we don't have any more questions at this point. Those are really good questions. Thank you guys for hanging on with us today and for learning. I will send Miss Jillian all the resources and get her your buzzsaw bags so you can make your own buzzsaw and, and, and play with it. That's a good thing to take on a car trip. When you get tired of your video game or phone, break out the buzzsaw. Stands the test of time. Yeah. So, all right. Thanks, friends. We really appreciate you hanging out with us today. Thank you all.